Hey guys, it's Bobby, aka Paginator, and today we're going to be doing the TBR game for the month of January 2024. Alright, so today we've got uh, our usual TBR avatar. I'm actually filming this way early just because of holiday stuff go going on and things, so it's December 16th as I'm filming this. Holy cow, it feels like way too early, but um, we're going to go ahead and go for it, and um, I always allow myself the ability to swap out books as long as they fit prompts, so things might change when we get closer to January or through the month of January, but you know, that's how it usually goes anyway. So let's get into the rolls. All right, so we've got our little Ron right down here in this quadrant, and we're going to start with roll number one. Just as a friendly reminder, my camera stand is like hollow metal, and so anytime I roll the dice, you might hear like a clanging echo sound through it. It usually picks up on camera a lot louder than it does for me, so my apologies if you get loud noises. I try to cut them out whenever possible. Three. One. Nope, that's the wrong way. One, two, three. Pick a card. We've got a very large stack of cards here, and what's it going to be? Cabbage Merchant. Book that keeps being dropped off your TBR. Okay, yeah, I've got one of those. Rule number one got us Cabbage Merchant, uh, a book that keeps keep getting dropped off your TBR. This one has been on at least two TBRs that I can think of during 2023. I need to read it. It's a verse novel. Why do I keep putting it off? I don't know. This is Alone by Megan E. Freeman. It is about a 12-year-old girl named Maddie who um, wakes up and she is completely alone in this snowy, crazy place. She's the only person left in town um, that has been, been mysteriously abandoned and evacuated, and so she has to survive on her own, and her only companions are a dog and all the books she can read. Roll number two. Three. One, two, three, another card. Cactus Juice. Read a book by a new to you author. Number two, got us Cactus Juice, a new to you author. And I'm going to go with one of my book of the month books. This is Gwen and Art Are Not in Love. This is by Lex Croucher. And I'm 99.999% sure that I haven't read anything by him before, or excuse me, her. Sorry, I just flipped to the back. Lex is her. her. <laughs> um, so let's read the synopsis for this one. It's been hundreds of years since King Arthur's reign. His descendant Arthur, a future lord and general gadabout, has been betrothed to Gwendolyn, the quick-witted, short-tempered princess of England since birth. The only thing they can't agree on is that they despise each other. They're forced to spend the summer together at Camelot in the run-up to their nuptials, and within 24 hours, Gwen has discovered Arthur kissing a boy, and Arthur has gone digging for Gwen's childhood diary and found confessions on her of her crush on the kingdom's only lady knight, Bridget Leclerc. So it sounds like both of these two are going to have some LGBT identity somewhere in here. Realizing they might make better allies than enemies, they make a reluctant pact, pact to cover for each other as things heat up at the annual royal tournament. Gwen is swept off her feet by her knight, and Arthur takes an interest in Gwen's royal brother. Hmm. Sounds like it could be fun. I do love a good retelling, so, I mean, might as well try it out. Roll number three. Four. One, two, three, four. This is just the end of a tunnel, so we don't need to move anywhere else, and we will pick another card. Tof. Read a book with the disability representation. So roll number three got us Tof, a book with disability representation. And for this one, I'm going to be choosing a book that I have reserved on Libby, but I don't have the physical copy. So I'll pop a picture up in the space here for you to see. It is Dust by Dusty Bowling. You may have heard me talking about it in my recent um, videos. There were two videos uh, that I made about new middle and high school books that I learned about at a teacher training. So this is about a girl who nearly died from an asthma attack when she was very young, and so her family moved to Arizona, which has a much better climate for um, people with asthma, and it's been 10 years, and she's doing great until this new boy, Adam, arrives at school, and Adam um, shows up at the same time that all these dust storms come, come into town, and of course, they make it hard for her to breathe, and she's also noticing there's some kind of correlation between Adam's emotions and when the dust storms get worse. 
especially when it's at the end of the school day and it's time to go home and these great big massive black clouds things come rolling into town and she's starting to wonder if home is maybe not a safe place for Adam if these if he and these storms are truly connected. Of course, she needs to find a way to stop the storms to help herself, but also she needs to find a way to help her new friend. Roll number four. Four. One, two, three, four. And another card. Lots of cards this time. Agni Kai, a book that features a competition. Rule number four got us Agni Kai, a book featuring a competition, and I'm going to be reading Check and Mate by Allie Hazelwood. This is a foray into YA for her. Usually she writes like new adult, I believe. It says, Mallory Greenleaf is done with chess. Every move counts nowadays. After the sport led to the destruction of her family four years earlier, Mallory's focus is on her mom, her sisters, and the dead-end job that keeps the lights on. That is until she begrudgingly agrees to play in one last charity tournament and inadvertently wipes the board with notorious king killer Nolan Sawyer, current world champion and reigning bad boy of chess. Nolan's loss to an unknown rookie shocks everyone, especially Mallory. What's even more confusing? His desire to cross pawns again. What kind of gambit is Nolan playing? The smart move would be to walk away, resign, game over. But Mallory's victory opens the door to sorely needed cash prizes, and despite everything, she can't help feeling drawn to the enigmatic strategist. As she rockets up the ranks, Mallory struggles to keep her family safely separated from the game that wrecked it in the first place. And as her love for the sport she so desperately wanted to hate begins to rekindle, Mallory quickly realizes that the games aren't only on the board, the spotlight is hotter than she imagined, and the competition can be fiercely attractive and intelligent and infuriating. Hmm. I smell an enemies to lovers plot. Roll number five. Four. I'm getting lots of threes and fours today. One, two, three, four. Another card. Can you see Ron? He's right there. I know, shadows and stuff. I am uh, working on getting a new light set up here. Um, the things that I have ordered online just haven't arrived yet. Azula, book with a morally gray characters or villains POV. Rule number five got us Azula, a morally gray character or villains POV. So I hopped onto to Google and typed in um, villain POV books and a link to a Goodreads list came up. And number one on here is a book that I have had for ages and keep meaning to read. Vicious by V.E. Schwab. So this synopsis says, Victor and Eli started out as two brilliant but arrogant college students who recognized the same sharpness and ambition in each other. In their senior year, a shared research interest in adrenaline, near-death experiences, and seemingly supernatural events reels an intriguing possibility that under the right conditions, someone could develop extraordinary abilities. But when their thesis moves from the academic to the experimental, things go horribly wrong. Ten years later, Victor breaks out of prison, determined to catch up to his old friend, now foe, aided by a young girl whose reserved nature obscures a stunning ability. Meanwhile, Eli is on a mission to eradicate every other super-powered person that he can find, aside from his sidekick, an enigmatic woman with an umbrella breakable will. Armed with terrible power on both sides, driven by the memory of betrayal and loss, the arch enemies have set a course for revenge, but who will be left alive at the end? Roll number six. Five. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, bending scroll. I'm gonna have to remind myself what that means. Okay, so this is where you get to treat yourself and buy a book from your wish list. Um, I'm already planning a book shopping trip and I want to keep that separate so it says you can substitute another prompt and I think I'm gonna do a random color palette generator. Alright so the random color palette generator I have this website here coolors.co c-o-o-l-o-r-s dot c-o and we're gonna generate three times so the generate buttons right up here by my thumb let's see first one Oh, start the generator. Okay, so we've got some grays and yellows, but that's only roll one. We're going to generate again. Some pastels. And finally, this one that counts. Okay, we've got some ash gray, pale dogwood, rosy brown, puce, and rose taupe. Roll number six, uh, we decided to go with a random color palette generator. And we saw those colors that were kind of light gray, a pale pink, maybe like a more purplish pink kind of pussy color as well. And I decided to go with this book, If You See Me Again Tomorrow by Robbie Couch. 
This one says Clark is trapped in today, literally. For some reason, he's woken up and relived the same monotonous Monday 309 times, and he has to admit that being stuck in a never-ending time loop is getting pretty lonely. Until day 310 turns out to be different. Suddenly, Clark's unusual torturous math class is interrupted by an anomaly, a boy he's never seen before in all his previous todays. When shy, anxious Clark decides to throw caution to the wind and join effusive, effervescent bow on a series of errands across the Windy City, he never imagines that he could fall this hard or this fast for someone in just one day. But in Bo, Clark feels like he might finally have found the answer to his loneliness. There's just one problem. How do you build a future with someone if you can never get to tomorrow? Roll number seven. Two. One. Two. Slow down. Does that, is that the thing where I have to cut my rolls in half? Oh, no. This means I get to take one book out of this month's TBR. So I think what I'll do, since I like doing the rolls and stuff so much, I'm still going to do a 10th roll, but I'll make that optional. Or maybe it'll count like as bonus points for me in my imaginary system. <laughs> and that doesn't really give us a prompt to work with, so we'll draw a card. The Blue Spirit. Read a blue book. Roll number seven got us the Blue Spirit, a blue book. Now this book has blue elements on it and I really wanted to get to this book in January so we're going with Aliana Girl of Dragons. This came in one of my Once Upon a Book Club boxes so I will be able to do a vlog opening all the presents most likely. Um, I can't guarantee that I will but most likely we'll do one of those. And this is a middle grade book. The synopsis says, Once upon a time, Aliana believed in dreams and fairy tales as sweet as sponge sugar clouds. She wished on shooting stars, sure that someday she and her grandmother would be able to travel to the capital city to see the queen. Then her grandmother passed away, and those dreams disappeared in a disenchanted puff. Now Aliana is forced to attend to the whims of her wicked stepmother with long days of cleaning her stepfamily's in as her skin burns raw or staying up until the crack of dawn to embroider her stepsister's ball gowns until she meets two beings who change her life forever. The first is a baby night dragon whom Aliana discovers she can magically talk to, and the second is Nella, a young witch. Nella needs Aliana's help in navigating a mysterious abyss filled with dangerous beasts, the creatures, Creatures Aliana understands better than her own stepfamily. This is a chance for Aliana to finally break free of her stepmother's shadow and to seize a chance at a life she's barely dared to hope for, but there's a risk. If caught, Aliana will be stuck working for her stepmother for the rest of her life. Can Aliana truly make wisps of dreams into her own better than a fairy tale happily ever after? Per perfect for fans of the Wings of Fire series, Shannon Hale and Gail Carson Levine, this enchanting fairy tale retelling of Japanese Cinderella will charm readers until the very last page. I love it. Another retelling. Roll number eight. One, the storm. I have to slide back here, which means we're back to this spot and we are rolling another card, or drawing another card. <laughs> Roll a card, that's funny. Library spirit, read something from somebody else's TBR. Oh, I have a hard time with this one, but I'll still try. Number eight, got us library spirit, a book from someone else's TBR. Now, this one's hard for me because it takes me so long to find something. Um, I went through Jade's TBR, I went through quite a few, and I finally just typed in my YouTube search bar, December TBR, found a video by Mariah's Moons, and she is going to be reading Wayward by Amelia Hart, so that one is going on my TBR. I believe this won the Goodreads Award for for Best Adult Fiction, I think, or Best Historical Fiction, I can't remember. It won something. <laughs> so the synopsis says, uh, we, we have some different time periods going on here. 2019. Under a cover of darkness, Kate flees, flees London for a ramsack shackle wayward cottage, inherited from a great aunt she barely remembers. With its tumbling ivy and overgrown gardens, the cottage is worlds away from the abusive partner who tormented Kate. But she soon suspects that her great aunt had a secret, one that lurks in the bones of the cottage hidden ever since the witch at hunts of the 17th century. Then 1619. Alpha is waiting trial for the murder of a local farmer who was stampeded to death by his herd. When Alpha was a girl, her mother taught her their magic, a kind not rooted to in spell casting, but in a deep knowledge of the natural world. But unusual women have always deem been deemed dangerous, and as the evidence of witchcraft is laid out against Alpha, she knows it will take all her powers to maintain her freedom. And then 1942, as World War II rages, Violet is trapped in her family's grand crumbling estate. Straight jacketed by societal convention, she longs for the robust education her brothers receive receives her brother receives and for her mother long deceased who was rumored to have gone mad before her death the only traces violet has of her are a locket bearing the initial w and the word wayward scratched into the baseboard of her bedroom weaving together the stories of three extraordinary women across five centuries wayward is an astonishing debut and a thrilling novel of female resistance 
Roll number nine. One. Minus five, so I have to go backward five. One, two, three, four, five, and pick a card. Wow, we are not making forward progress during this round. Ron's clear back here. And the card we have picked is... Fire Nation. Word fire in the title or fire on the cover. Roll number nine. We got Fire Nation. Fire in the title or fire on the cover. This one is a book I've been wanting to get to for quite a while, and there is a dragon breathing fire up at the very top. Can you see that little flame coming out of his mouth? This is the alar slightly alarming tale of the Whispering Wars by Jacqueline Moriarty. It is part of the Bronte Metalstone Adventures. The first book about Bronte Metalstone I absolutely loved. This one I'm excited about. This is going to switch um, characters though. The Bronte Adventures, I think what happens is Bronte shows up in all of them and she kind of leads off the series, but then we have other characters telling the next one. So, um, Finley lives in an orphanage school not far from Honeybee's home, the Braithelwaite Boarding School. At the Spindrift Sports Tournament, tensions are high, and before long, the orphans and boarding school kids are engaged in an all-out war. But when children start disappearing and the real Whispering Wars break out, Finley, Honeybee, and their friends must join forces. How can they outwit the powerful Whisperers? And who are the mysterious strangers who appear from the future? So this tells us it's actually set 12 years before the Bronte Metalstone story. Interesting. Okay. I'm figuring out more and more as I learn. Um, this, we just have to appreciate the cover. Carl James Mountford did the cover, and he's an absolutely brilliant illustrator, so his covers are always like magnets drawing me, and I'm like, ooh, I want to read it. It looks so pretty. Which I know you're not supposed to do, but, I mean, let's be honest, we all do it. Roll number 10. One. 20 sided die. Alright, so last month I also got 20-sided dice, and I have told you then that I lost my 20-sided dice somehow, somewhere, and I refuse to buy another one because I know it's going to show up at some point. So we're going to use an online one, and I'm going to roll it three times because I just like to do that. One, two, three, and we get number three. So according to my list here, number three is Starling House by Alex E. Harrow. Roll number 10. So this is going to be optional because we got that, that bonus, like, remove a book from your TBR thing. Um, but this is also a book that I'm really interested in. So we'll just see how it goes. So we got 20-sided die, and we rolled Starling House by Alex E. Harrow. The other two books I've read by this author have been fantastic, so I have high hopes for this one. It is not quite as chunky as Once in Future Witches. So that's nice, because um, her last book was chonky. This one says, I dream sometimes about a house I've never seen. Opal is a lot of things. Orphan, high school dropout, full-time cynic, and part-time cashier. But above all, she's determined to find a better life for her younger brother, Jasper. One that gets them out of Eden, Kentucky. A town remarkable for only two things. Bad luck and E. Starling, the reclusive 19th century author of The Underland, who disappeared over 100 years ago. All she left behind were dark rumors in her home. Everyone agrees that it's best to ignore the uncanny mansion and the misanthropic heir, Arthur. Almost everyone, anyway. Opal has been assessed with the Underland since she was a child. When she gets a chance to step inside Starling House and make some extra cash for her brother's escape fund, she can't resist. But sinister forces are digging deeper into the buried secrets of Starling House, and Arthur's own nightmares have become far too real. As Eden itself seems to be drowning in its own ghosts, Opal realizes that she might finally have found a reason to stick around. And now she'll have to fight. So overall, I think I've got a good mix of books for the month of January, but as I said, some books might get switched out depending because this is being filmed so, so far ahead of time. Um, but as it is, I hope you guys are enjoying the holiday season and whatever you celebrate in whichever way you celebrate, I hope you're having a wonderful time. Please know that you're not alone. You can always reach out to me if you need to. Have a wonderful, magical, and bookish day. Happy reading. Adios.